All right. Well, good morning. How are you today? Good. All right. Hey, welcome to those of you watching online and joining with us. We're so glad to have you here today. Uh, you could have been doing a lot of things on Memorial Weekend, but we're so glad. I'm so glad you chose to be here today. And I hope by the time we get to the end of the message, uh, you'll feel the same way if you don't already. Um, in case I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, my name's Seth, and I would love the chance to say hi uh, following the service. So I want to start off today by talking about the lines that we all have, because there are certain lines in our lives that we won't cross, right? I mean, there are certain lines you won't cross, like with food. Uh, I don't, you know, John, who was just up here, I don't know if you know John well or not, but um, he used to spend some time in China with work, and um, he has this incredible story, I'm stealing it from him, where he ate a raw snake bladder full of whatever snake bladders are full of, right? That's a line I wouldn't cross. Um, John also has been known to eat at Taco Bell twice in a week, so clearly he has no lines, right? Let me show you where my lines are as it comes to the things that I have. Here are my lines, right? Uh, th these are friends, not food, um, and I threw the cats up there for you cat lovers so you can't complain too much about it, right? I mean, we've got the, the mushrooms. Some of you are shroom fans. I'm not. I, you know, I can't do that. The beets, that was the worst. You know, guinea pigs. I just, you know, those are just kind of lines that I draw. Sometimes uh, we have fashion lines, right? I mean, maybe there's are some ways in which you wouldn't dress. Um, these are ways in which I will not dress, nor will I allow my children to dress. Now, maybe when they move up out of the house, they'll, they'll change the way. Uh, we have lines with where we'll sleep, right? Um, some of you are the Ritz-Carlton people. Others of you are the campsite people. We, we just have our own lines. And then sometimes we have lines with cars. Uh, let me just show you my line with cars. Um, I'm not going to drive a smart car because I don't even think I'd fit in there. It'd look like I'm getting out of a clown car every time. Uh, and then, <laughs> no offense, if you have a smart car, I didn't mean, and, and no offense to clowns either. Um, <clears throat> You know, we'll offend everybody here. And the, the Hummer, right? I mean, that could be another line. But, but here's the point. We can laugh at about all of that. But here's the thing. Where we draw our lines is important. I mean, it really is, particularly with the significant things in life. I mean, we kind of joke about some of that stuff. But, you know, right now, this weekend, with the United States, we're celebrating Memorial Day. There's, there's a line with freedom, isn't there? I mean, years ago, back in the day when we were just a colony or a bunch of colonies, a group of colonies, there was taxation without what? Anybody know? Representation. We're like, no, 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 that's not right. We draw a line with that. And, and now we're known as the land of the what? The free. Yeah, for two of you who remembered that. The rest of you should know, right? And, and even, you know, think back over the last year with the pandemic and lockdowns and masks and all that stuff. I mean, we've kind of, we're like, okay, we want to we want to respect authority, but there's a line. There's a, there's a point where which, in which you're not going to control me anymore, right? So, I mean, we just kind of have, we have lines with that. We have lines with morality. And honestly, we all have these lines, regardless of where you fall on, in morality, regardless of what you think is okay or not okay or moral or immoral, you've got a line. And you say, uh, you shouldn't cross that line. And I tell you what, there are people who have crossed that line that you look at and you think, I can't believe they do that. But you know what? Those people have their own lines that they would never cross, stuff that you can't even imagine that's so awful in your mind that you can even imagine, and yet they think, there's no way I'd cross that line. I mean, we all, <laughs> we all have lines. And here's what's interesting about our lines. Our lines define for us what we value, right? They, they define what's important to us. They also define other people, right? Because there are the people who fall into our category that's above the line, and then there are those who fall below, those who are not below the line. It becomes us versus them. It's their values, their morals, the things that they hold dear, and us and our morals and the things that we hold dear. And what's interesting, and this is kind of what we're going to talk about today, and that is that churches have lines too. Maybe you've bumped into that. Maybe you know what I'm talking about, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But let me just say, before we get there, we're continuing on in our series. We all fall down. We all fall down. I want to give you a quick recap, because if you're here for the first time or joining us online for the first time, you're stepping in at the end of a month, right? We've been spending a month together talking about all this stuff. And so I'll just kind of do a really quick overview catch up, because we've been talking about how we all fall down, right? That's the title of the series. We all fall down, and we all do this. We all sin, and as uncomfortable as that word is, the word sin implies that we all fall below a line at some point in time. And again, it's uncomfortable, but it's so important. But the good news, the good news, and in fact, if you've ever heard the term gospel before, 
The word gospel just means good news. And actually, as you begin to understand the gospel, you realize it's not just good news, it's really good news. And actually, over time, it becomes great news. I mean, the great news is that God meets us where we are, and he extends something so important to us. Dan talked about this. He extends grace. And because God has extended his grace, his kindness, because Jesus died for us, not when we were his friends, but when we were his enemies, when we were kind of pushing him away and saying, I don't care what you want from me. I'm going to do my own thing. God meets us in that place. He gives us grace. And because of the grace that he's given to us, we have an invitation and an opportunity, and you might even say an obligation, to extend that grace to other people. And then last week, we talked about how we can prevent ourselves from falling so hard, prevent ourselves from hurting those that we love the most. How do we kind of keep ourselves, if at all possible, from sinning, or at least from sinning to such a degree that it causes the undue harm and pain that so many of us have experienced in our time? So that's what we've been talking about. If you missed any of those, I'd encourage you to check them out on our app. You can use that. That's the easiest way to catch up on a message or share a message or a series with a friend. And if you have appreciated this series, we would love to hear back from you because we just absolutely believe this is who we are as a church. We believe this is who God has called every follower of Jesus to be. And so this is just paramount to, to what we believe is so important for those of us who call ourselves his followers. So as I said earlier, we all have lines. We inherently know this. And we also know that churches have lines too, right? Churches have lines, whether it's your first time in church or you just heard of church, you know, or maybe you grew up in church and you've been here all the time. You realize that churches have lines. And we bump into these lines in a couple ways. One of the ways is with the question, we wonder, am I welcome here even though I... And then you can just fill that blank in with whatever you think falls below the line. Even though I vote Republican, even though I vote Democrat, am I welcome here even though I'm divorced? Am I welcome here even though I'm LGBTQ plus? Am I welcome here even though I curse like a sailor? Am I welcome here even though I'm not sure if God's real and I have questions about faith? Am I welcome here even though I have a habit or I have an addiction or, you know, I look at pornography? Am I welcome here even though I battle with this or even though I'm a hypocrite, right? I mean, people just wonder, am I welcome here even though I do this? And at the other side, and and these aren't necessarily in opposition to each other, although usually we fall into one camp or the other as it comes to these questions. The first one's, am I welcome here even though I? And then the second one is surely they wouldn't be welcome here because they and you fill in the blank with pretty much the same thing, right? The same stuff as before. Are they going to, surely we're not going to let them in the church, right? I mean, surely we've got some standards here. When I was in high school, I had a friend who was agnostic. He was one of my best friends. He was a brilliant guy, brilliant. Got a 1600 on the SATs, ended up going to Princeton for school. Um, and he was one of my best friends. And one year we had these annual student ministry uh, summer retreats. And I invited him in high school to go on this retreat. So he doesn't know if he believes God's real or not. You know, and he's on this retreat. And he's so smart. He was a gifted pianist. And the worship uh, pastor discovered that during our week. And so he invited my friend to play on the worship band. <gasps> right? I mean, and all of a sudden, all these other students like, ooh, you know, what are we doing here? We've got a line that he's bumping up against. And we didn't even, he didn't even know, right? And so, so I mean, they're all upset. And they're going to the pastor like, oh, we can't let him play, the, play in the band because he's not sure he believes that God is real. Now, mind you, they weren't asking themselves the question about, well, I'm not honoring my parents or, you know, I cursed like a sailor or I cheated on my homework or I cheated on the test or whatever. I mean, they weren't concerned about that. They were concerned with him. <laughs> and here's the thing. There's a tendency. There's a tendency for religious people to draw a line at the lowest common denominator of sin that they are okay with. It's true. It's uncomfortable, right? But we're going to have to put on our big boy, big girl pants today, okay? Because we're going to talk about some uncomfortable things. And this is, this is absolutely true. It's like John's bullseye. If you were here for the first week, he had a target. He talks about shooting arrows at the target. And, and most of us are never going to get the bullseye. In fact, None of us, that's the whole point, we all fall down. None of us is ever going to get the bullseye. So if we, as long as we get in that inner ring, right, or the second ring out, then we're okay. I mean, that's the lowest common denominator of sin that we're okay with. The question is, where is my line, right? Where is my line? Or maybe another way of asking the question is, what's the line, what's the line below which a person falls outside of grace? 
What's the line at which they're not really welcome here anymore? They're not allowed to be a part of the church anymore because they've, you know, they're, they've kind of fallen below. They've fallen below. Now again, today, we're going to have a little self-confrontation because there's a really sneaky follow-up question to this, and it's kind of hidden within this question, and it's something that we don't honest, honestly always want to be honest with ourselves about. And the question is, what sins am I okay with myself or others committing? Right? I know all sin's bad, wink, wink, but, but not all sin's quite as bad. So which are the ones that aren't quite as bad? And since we all sin, let's just go ahead and define the sins that aren't, eh, you know, they're okay. Right? Every church has got these, like gluttony, you know, and not even with food, right? I won't even ask you ladies or guys how many pairs of shoes you own. At what point is that gluttony? Or how many purses? Or how full your closets are? Or how much time you binge watch Netflix? Or how much time you spend on social media? Or how much money you spend on yourself? I mean, that can all be forms of gluttony if we're really honest. And food can be a part of it too. I'm not saying it isn't. What about gossip? I mean, most churches are known for, you know, to talk behind each other's backs. And then when you ask them about it, it's like, oh, you lie. You don't even think twice. Well, I can't be honest about that. I mean, that'd make me look bad, right? But that's okay. We're nobody, nobody's put on church discipline for gossiping and lying or for spending too much time on social media. Or lust, right? Look, but don't touch. It's okay to look as long as you don't touch. I knew a pastor a couple years ago who used to go on mission trips to Brazil where we had been, and he was telling me about how he loved going to the beaches looking at the women. It's like, what? Like, that's okay, right? As long as I'm looking but not touching, like there's no problem there, right? Or it's okay to covet. I really, really want what you have, and that's okay. I don't need to worry about how that's lodged deep inside my heart. That's not a big deal, right? Nobody's put it on church discipline for coveting. Listen, we all draw our lines. Every church has this list, but the thing you absolutely need to know is that God draws the line at perfect. He draws the line at perfect. We sometimes look at these quote-unquote minor sins as no big deal. But I'm telling you, Jesus looked at that. Jesus looked at that and he realized something really important. He realized that any sin would require his death. Any sin, all sin, any sin, regardless of how big, how small, how significant, or how seemingly insignificant. And the thing that Jesus knew is our propensity to draw lines. And quite honestly, I think that's one of the reasons why the story we're going to take a look at today is preserved for us 2,000 years later, because it is absolutely a story about drawing lines. And there is an invitation, I believe, for every one of us, regardless of where you fall, on the top of your line or on the bottom of somebody else's. Before we get to the story, I want to tell you a little bit about the location, because the location it takes place is actually really important. It takes place at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Now, I've never actually been to Jerusalem, though I'd love to go someday, although not right now, um, because it's a little sketchy over there right now, but it took place there, and at the Temple Mount, there was Herod's Temple. This was the temple that that, um, was there during Jesus' day. Now, Herod's Temple is called Herod's Temple because King Herod built it. It wasn't a temple to him. It was a temple built by him to make the Jewish people happy, and uh, here's a picture of the Temple Mount. This is actually a modern-day picture of the Temple Mount, and here's what's kind of fascinating. Right here, this is called the Dome of the Rock. It was built in 691 AD. It's actually a Muslim shrine. And then there's the Dome of the Chain, which is this little building right there, and it's an accessory building to the Dome of the Rock. And then there's this, which is um, a mosque. And so this formerly Jewish holy site has now also become a Muslim holy site. And so it's just kind of, you know, you can begin to see where the tensions may come about um, modern day. Um, The Jews have a wall there that's called the Wailing Wall. And at this wall, some of these stones are believed to have been come from the original temple that was built by King Solomon around 1000 BC. And because the Jewish people don't have a temple any longer that they can go to, they, many believe that God's Shekinah glory, the divine glory of his presence is actually in this wall. And so they go to the wall now to worship God. Now the, 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 um, uh, 
The Wailing Wall wasn't there in Jesus' day. But during Jesus' day, the Temple and the Temple Mount was really the epicenter of religious activity. It was 30 acres in size. Here's kind of a picture of the whole thing. 30 acres in size, and then you had the Temple over here. And inside the Temple was the Holy of Holies. And back in the original Temple that Solomon had built, inside the Holy Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were the stone tablets that God had etched with his finger and given to Moses. Inside was a jar of of manna from when the Israelites were wandering around in the wilderness. Inside was Aaron's staff that had budded. And it was in the 1900s when the Nazis opened that ark and their faces would later melt off. For those of you who enjoy Indiana Jones, that's not actual history, right? That's just Hollywood. Although it's a great story. Um, So the thing you should know is that this area was noisy. It was smelly because there were animals that were being brought there. There were animals that were being slaughtered there. There's a wall across the southern uh, part of the Temple Mount that's about 900 plus feet long, and then there are these southern steps that have recently been excavated. The southern steps are about 240 feet wide, and they're slightly higher than what's comfortable for a person to walk up. And so what would happen during Jesus' day is that in order to get to the Temple Mount, people would bring their sacrifice, they'd bring their pigeon, they'd bring their grain offering, they'd go to the temple, they would offer this before God as penance for their sin so that they could be restored with God. This was kind of their stairway to restitution, their stairway to reconciliation, their stairway to heaven, if you will. And so they would go and they'd make their offering, they'd make their sacrifices, they'd descend down those steps knowing that they were free, free from condemnation, free from their sin, free to go back to life. Now the thing you should know is that the men in the account that we're going to look at, and these were undoubtedly men, the men who were in this account had climbed up these steps the morning that this story took place climbed up these steps into this Temple Mount area, into the area where the Ark of the Covenant had been. It, wasn't, it was lost in Jesus' day or before Jesus' day, so they didn't know where it was. Um, and they went there to meet with God. So here's what the text says. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 2, says, At dawn, so this is early in the morning, he, that's Jesus, contextually, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. So this is something that Jesus would do regularly when he was in the region. He would go to those kind of temple courts outside of the the temple area, but in the temple mount area, and he would find a quiet place to sit, maybe a tree or rock he could sit on where he could teach in the shade. This has happened multiple days in a row, most likely. In fact, Jesus probably had sent the crowds away the night before. He'd gone to the Mount of Olives to spend the night, and that morning, either crowds of people followed him, or they were already there when he arrived. As the dawn was breaking and as day was beginning to set in, he climbed up those same steps that we were just talking about, and he began to teach. He began to teach. Continuing on, the text tells us that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, And they made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, and we'll get to what they said here in just a second. Now, this kind of begs a question of where did they find this woman, first of all? Where had they been keeping this woman during this time period, right? I mean, because, you know, adultery clearly falls below the line. It's one of the big 10, if you're not familiar. There's, you know, that and lying are kind of the two of the big 10 that we know. The other eight, we don't really care about. But, you know, those are the two. And so, you know, clearly she falls below the line um, and clearly she's a pawn and they've set a trap. And they're wanting to catch Jesus, And so they bring this woman, they parade her in, they throw her down and say, all right, Jesus, what are you going to do with her? Now, I got to be honest, people do that with us pastors all the time. Maybe not all the time, but it happens. Where somebody will call us up, me or John or Dan, and be like, hey, you know, you just need to know that so-and-so is doing such and such. And And we just think the church the church should do something about it. We just think the church should know. I just think, you know, you, you would want to know because you're somebody who cares about things religious. Now, we wouldn't know about it if you didn't just tell us, and you're not obviously going to do anything about it, but you want us to do something on your behalf, and that's essentially what these guys are doing. They drag this woman up these very familiar steps. They push through the crowd. Excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. As Jesus is teaching, and they begin this incredible spectacle as they throw her 
in front of Jesus. And here's what they said to him. They said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the act. Oh, we caught her in the middle of it, in the act of adultery. I mean, she broke a commandment. Jesus, surely you care about this. This is so important. So we caught her for you and we saved her up all night so you could deal with her. Aren't you glad? I mean, don't you appreciate that, Jesus? You're welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. Now, I just can't imagine if you were in the crowd that day, right? I mean, you went there, you went hoping to hear Jesus teach. Uh, Maybe you were hoping he would heal you or lay his hands on you or pray for you or pray for your kids. And all of a sudden, this spectacle is unfolding right before your eyes. And you're thinking to yourself, I'm glad I'm not who? Her, right? Because nobody wants to be in that position. Nobody wants to be in that position where men with robes and authority rush in with their their scripture behind them and their law behind them to condemn this poor woman. See, sometimes I think we forget about the reality of this. We forget that there were real people with real emotion in this story. And then there's the woman who's standing there being thrown before these men, being thrown before Jesus, walking up steps that she had no doubt walked up dozens of times before as a little girl and even as a young adult, bringing her sacrifices for her sin. It was a very familiar place with animals, sheep bleating in the background, sacrifices (laughs) taking place. And then the men say this, they say, in the law, which is kind of their way of saying, be careful, Jesus, because don't forget where you are. Don't forget that the Ten Commandments used to live right over there in that temple area in the Holy of Holies. Don't forget where you are and the significance of this place. Now, I'm telling you, this was a carefully orchestrated set of events. The woman, I mean, maybe they'd been watching her for days. We don't know, waiting for the perfect time, waiting for Jesus to be there, waiting for the the location because they want to pit Jesus against the law of Moses. So it's like, think long and hard before you answer us, Jesus, because here's what it says. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Hmm. Go ahead, Jesus, you deal with this one. Mic drop. And I just can't even imagine the emotion of that moment. I can't imagine what they were thinking, what they were feeling. But that question, Jesus, what are you going to do with this woman who clearly, I mean, clearly she falls below the line. Now, Jesus had a number of options. I mean, he could have responded a lot of ways. He could have said, well, why didn't you go ahead and stone her then? You know the law. Why didn't you go ahead and stone her? Or he could have quoted the entire law back to them, which here's what the entire law says in Leviticus. He says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. So where's the dude, right? I mean, why do you just care about the woman? But honestly, it had nothing to do with the actual law. It had nothing to do with the actual woman. Again, she was just a pawn. The the Jews didn't have permission to stone somebody. And let's be honest, how often were people stoned? I don't don't really know. I guess it happened sometimes. But but the Jews weren't allowed to stone anybody, which is why when Jesus was going to be crucified, the Jewish authorities had to take him to Pontius Pilate to have Rome's permission to crucify him. They couldn't enact the death penalty. So it was all just a setup. The religious men with their religious texts, doing their religious thing, drawing their religious line. And John, in his commentary, he tells us this, that they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Because they didn't want him to continue having the power that he had. They didn't like the influence that he was having on people. Right? He's known as this friend to sinners. Okay, well, we'll throw you into this situation. If you're such a friend to sinners, let's see. You're not going to say to stoner, but if you're such a great teacher, you're not going to say to violate the law of Moses. So what are you going to do, Jesus? I mean, this was just a total charade with the goal of getting Jesus. And you know what else? They weren't at all concerned about the woman. They weren't concerned about her welfare. They weren't even concerned about her really breaking the law. (laughs) Because line drawing people, they're rarely concerned about the welfare of others. I mean, honestly, they're concerned about maintaining their power. They're concerned about making themselves feel good. They're concerned about living in their space where they're on top of the line, maybe even on top of the world. So with the temple as a backdrop, 
I mean, these guys are essentially looking at Jesus saying, Jesus, are you greater than this? Are you greater than Moses? Are you greater than the law? Are you greater than the Ten Commandments? Are you greater than the sacrificial system that has held our country together for hundreds of years? I think you and I can't really even begin to understand how tense this was. And I have to sometimes wonder, was this one of those moments where his disciples were looking at each other like, hmm, I'm not really sure how this one's going to go down, right? It's like, hey, John, why don't you stay at the front and record it? Because Peter needs to use the bathroom, and I'm going to go with him, right? And we'll be back in a little bit. Excuse me, sir, you go forward. Yeah, yeah ma'am, yeah, get a better view, you know? Because there's this slow motion train wreck taking place, and we all know how that goes, right? We know we don't want to look, but we look anyway, because it's a slow motion train wreck, and you kind of want to see what's going to happen. They're like, let's get out of here while we can. I don't know. I don't know. But here's what the text tells us. But Jesus, he bent down. Rather than answering them directly, he bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, this is kind of interesting because, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, the Jewish people of this day, the Orthodox Jews today, even Christians today, I mean, we believe that God, he inscribed the Ten Commandments with his finger. And John says Jesus is down there writing with his finger. And it's almost as though it's not just Jesus up against Moses or, you know, the law or the, the temple system. It's almost like it's the finger of Jesus against the finger of God. And they're almost set in opposition with one another because these people didn't realize who Jesus was. They didn't realize that he is God. And so he begins to write on the ground with his finger, which is fascinating and it clearly didn't satisfy them. So the text continues that, that when they kept on questioning him, badgering him, come on, Jesus, ache him on, you know, give us an answer, questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, this is so rich. This is so brilliant. This is why, I mean, no, no human could make this up, right? He said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. And with that simple statement, Jesus completely silenced the woman's accusers. And he reminded them of the countless times they themselves had climbed up those southern steps, not for the goal of bringing somebody before Jesus, but for the goal of paying penance for their own sins and bringing a sacrifice to be offered on the altar so that they would receive forgiveness for their sins and how they had walked back down those steps guilt-free, having dumped their sin bucket on the altar, ready to go fill it back up so that they could come back again and again and again many, many times. And so suddenly this location, it took on new significance. But you know what's really interesting about this story? It's that there was someone there without sin, and he was the only one who wasn't holding a stone. He also happened to be the only one who understood how deadly sin is and how much sin would cost him. He knew that her sin of adultery and their sin of self-righteousness would both cost him his life. He is the only one who understood the significance of it. And yet he was the only one who was not ready to throw a stone. John tells us, again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground and everybody always wants to know, what did he write? We don't really know. Maybe he drew a line and all the sins, everybody's committed underneath the line. I don't really know. Maybe he wrote the word perfect. I, I'm not really sure. What was he writing? Nobody knows. But we know the effect that it had because he continues on and he says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Because one by one, they realize their own unworthiness. They realize their own self-righteousness. They realize that they fell below the line of perfection. And so they walked down the steps. And only Jesus was left in this very strange situation. with This woman standing before him, and I have to believe she had no idea whose presence she was in. I have to believe she had no idea what Jesus would do for her. But the text tells us Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? 
Now, this is kind of an interesting question because he's like, where did all the perfect people go? Then he doesn't say, you know, does nobody accuse you? Of course, people accused her. Are you guilty? Of course, she was guilty. But he essentially says, is there anyone who's here who's going to force you to pay for what you've done? To force you to pay the penalty for living below the line. And so she answered, she said, no one, sir. No one, sir. No one's here to force me to pay. Now, Jesus responded to this, and and his response is so rich. It is so rich, and I hope it's something that you lean really closely into. In fact, it could be that for you today, this is the thing you need to hear. This is so important because of your background, because of your history, because of your connection with this woman. Maybe, maybe you feel the same way. Maybe you came here today because of something you did last night or something you did last week, and you're just trying to pay penance, and you want to make things right, and, and you want to be able to tell your mom and dad, hey, I went to church today, or whatever it is. I mean, I don't know, but I, all I know is that, that what he says next is so important for all of us regardless of where you fall. All of us in the room fall on one side of that original question, those two questions, you know. Are they allowed here because they, or am I allowed here because I, right? Jesus' response is so important. Here's what he said. He says, then neither do I condemn you. I'm not going to force you to pay. In fact, those of us who know the story of Jesus, we understand that essentially he would go on to say, I'm going to pay for you. You can't pay this debt, so I'm going to give my life to pay this debt for you. And in making this statement, I mean, Jesus is basically declaring, I'm greater than Moses, I'm greater than the temple, I'm greater than the Ten Commandments, because I'm going to replace what has been in place. And something new is dawning as I am giving my life, as I am paying the penalty for you. So I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. And then he gave her a command, which is kind of curious. And again, this is something we need to lean into and pay close attention to. Because he says, neither do I condemn you. But then he said this. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. Not go now and go collect your guy because he's waiting in bed for you. Not go now and return to the life that you came from. Don't go any way you want Whatever way you go, you need to stop sinning. Because Jesus understood something so important. He understood that sin kills things. And all sin, regardless of how small or how big, all sin, any sin is devastating. Any sin is devastating. Because do you know where God draws the line? He draws the line at perfection. He draws the line at perfection, and as long as you fall short of perfection, you need somebody to be perfect for you. And the law can never make you perfect. The law defines perfect. The law helps us understand how imperfect we are and how much you and I need a Savior. But it doesn't give us permission to stop caring, and it doesn't give us permission to stop worrying about the small things. And one of the temptations in church, quite honestly, if you grew up in church, if you've spent a lot of years in church, you know this, is we become numb to the small things. They just don't matter, right? The little, little white lies, you know, the gossip, the lust, you know, look, don't touch, you know, the, the, the differing views of, of sexuality that surely that's not popular in today's world, so we can't do that. The, the concept of God gave me all this resources, I'm going to be generous. I mean, you know, So we just define godliness with our lines. Wherever we are, wherever the lowest common denominator is, we just define godliness with our lines. And that's where we are. That's where we're happy. And they fall below the line, so we're going to cast them off. And yet we lose sight in the process of the work that God needs to do in us. Because I guarantee you, wherever you are in the journey of faith, God wants to do work in you. Because as far as I know, you haven't arrived here yet. And neither have I. In fact, here's what I want you to do. This is going to be super awkward. Those of you watching online, you can say it to the people in the room with you. I want you to turn to the person next to you and just say to them, look at them in the eye, say, you fall below the line. Go ahead. It's super awkward. Go ahead and do it. And then you can reply back and say, yeah, well, so do you, right? Yeah, well, so do you. Here's my point. It is only by God's grace It is only by God's grace that any one of us is here. 
Now, I understand the temptation when you hear a message like this, you're th- especially if you grew up in church and you know, you've got the law and whatever memorized, and, and you're thinking, yeah, but Seth, what about, and you've got this category or you've got this thing, and like, you know, what about that? Does that not matter? I mean, should I not care about that? And my response to that is, yes, we absolutely should care about that. Why? Because as I said, sin kills things. Jesus knew sin kills things, which is why he told the woman to go leave your life of sin. I don't condemn you. Leave your life of sin. There was this healthy tension Jesus was happy to live in of absolute grace and absolute truth and saying, I'm going to meet you somewhere in the middle. The truth still applies, but my grace still applies too. And he knew that this woman's adultery, again, as well as the self-righteousness of the men who were there, would cause him to have to go to the cross. So absolutely sin kills. And wherever we fall below the line of perfection, we are going to face undue stress. We're going to face undue pain, undue circumstances. Even forgiven sin kills things. We've talked about that before. Even forgiven sin continues. I mean, we've killed relationships, we've killed finances, we've killed retirements, we've killed, you know, all kinds of things because of our sin. So of course, God is going to look at us and say, go sin no more. Avoid the ongoing consequences. Let me help you. Jesus, don't miss this. He never invited people to stay where they were, ever. He never said, oh, great, you're good, right? It was always, come follow me, and I'm going to teach you something. Come follow me, and I have something different for you. Everyone who wanted to step in his direction had a seat at the table. But Jesus refused to leave anybody where they were because he knew the costly nature of sin. I'm telling you, my friends, we know the costly nature of sin too because we have lived it. We have lived it. And so as John, you know, he talked about our vision a little bit ago, creating a community where all people can connect to God's story. That is who we are. You have a seat at the table. If you're wondering, am I welcome here because I, the answer is yes. Yes, as long as you're willing to continue taking a step forward and as long as you don't mind being pushed, right? Because we're going to do that. We're not going to sacrifice what's true for grace and we're not going to sacrifice grace for what's true. We're going to live somewhere in the tension of all of that. And Jesus always invited people to follow him. Not just know good stuff. There is a big difference. Not just believe stuff, right? I can believe I should eat healthy and exercise, but if I don't do it, it doesn't matter. I can buy a can of paint and know all about paint and have it sitting on the floor, but until I put it on the wall and apply it, it does no value to me. Jesus always invited people in the direction of application and saying, what do I need to do to move in God's direction? How do I follow him? I'm telling you, our vision as a church is we do not throw stones here. We do not throw stones because (laughs) we realize we'd have to throw stones at ourselves if we're just really straight and honest with each other. And so part of the problem is, depending on your church background and your church history, you were taught to throw stones. So many of us were. And so it could be that as a result of today, you've got to learn the importance of putting your stone down and saying, go sin no more. We're not here to condemn you, but we want to invite you into a different way of being and knowing and doing and following because God has something incredible for you. John, who recorded this account, would go on in John chapter 10, verse 10 to say, I have come, this is Jesus, quoting Jesus, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That is what God wants for you. Do not miss it. Do not miss it. For some of us, you know, I mean, kind of my story is I grew up in church, right? I felt like I lived above the line. And part of my journey of growth has been learning to put my stone down and to say, God, I need to ask your forgiveness for my own self-righteousness, for my own pride, for my own thinking that I don't really need grace, which is so not true. And so it could be for you, you know, your application to today is to just... Thank God for his incredible grace and to set your stone down. It could be that you're feeling more like the woman and you never thought you could relate to a Bible character, but here you are, right? I mean, you didn't want to be at this place and you're uncomfortable and whatever else. And the thing you just need to know is that Jesus did not abandon her. He did not throw her to the wolves. He didn't say, yeah, go ahead, pelt her with those rocks. 
Jesus showed his incredible grace and said, I don't condemn you, but there is a different path. I am inviting you into a different way of knowing, a different way of being, a different way of living. Come, follow me. And it could be for you that Jesus is inviting you into a different way and calling you to follow him. And I know that's hard, and I know it's uncomfortable, and you say, but I don't know, and I've tried, and I've prayed, and you know, I get all that. Let us be a part of your journey. Because we're all on the journey of moving in his direction, step by step. And he meets all of us where we are, and then he gives us the strength and the power by his Holy Spirit living in us to move us in his direction. So if that's you today, in just a second, I want to pray for us, and I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes, and I just wonder if you would raise your hand. So go ahead, do that. Close your, bow your heads, close your eyes, because I just want this to be a private sort of thing. If God is calling you to move in a different direction, in order to follow Jesus, something needs to change, and you're not sure how, but you know it needs to be different, would you just raise your hand for a second? I want to pray for you in a minute. Thank you. I know God has something good for you. He is inviting you. And we don't condemn you. Let me just pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends in this room who have their hands raised right now. Who know that the direction they are in is not the direction you have for them. Father, would you just wreck them Would you bring them to a place of submission and surrender and help them not to feel condemnation, but an invitation? Father, I pray that we as a church can wrap our arms around them, surround them, give them the support and the love that they need, never pulling back from truth and never pulling back from grace, but living in this messy middle. Father, for every one of us in the room, I pray that you would help us to be continually taking steps in your direction, that we would consistently, consistently say yes to you as uncomfortable as it is, as difficult, as painful, as much as we have to sacrifice the things that that have become comfortable to us. Father, would you meet us in that space? Give us wisdom to know what we need to do. Father, fill us with your spirit to empower us. And Lord, we are so grateful. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.